Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new research or columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Berezin. Hi, Josh. Hi, Lisa. Today, we're going to talk about Medicare, Medicaid, and some of the challenges faced by people who have coverage from both programs from the perspective of a clinically informed economist. We're very happy to have Dr. Eric Slade, who is a professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Nursing and at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, here to talk about his and co-authored recent paper, Psychiatrist and Non-Psychiatrist Physician Network Breath in Dual Eligible Special Needs Plans. So Dr. Slade, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you. So, you know, it's perusing some of your prior research, and I sort of expected all this uh, mental health services research to come up and that came up, but you're, you've got a huge range of topics that you're collaborating on. So um, I'm interested in how you got into this particular topic and then also if and how you think it fits in with your broader kind of research program. Right. So it's probably worth mentioning that I'm a health economist by training and I got into mental health services research after graduate school when I was trainee as part of a, I'm sorry, I wasn't a trainee, (laughs) as a faculty member who was part of. Sometimes trainees feel like faculty members. Sometimes sometimes faculty members members feel feel like like trainees. trainees. Uh, But I uh, joined the faculty at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in the 90s. And at that time, there was an NIMH supported training center there focusing on health economics. And that's how I got into mental health care research. And then a couple of years ago, I started working with a colleague at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, Dan Polsky, who was very interested in Medicare and Medicare Advantage. And we started working together and got onto this topic of psychiatrist networks in Medicare Advantage. One of the biggest sins was naming Medicare and Medicaid with like two letters that were different in the words. And it's like, we've just It's like, could you design something that would be harder to interpret at a consumer level? So I just want to make sure we're all level setting. This is helpful for me, but my listeners are like, we all know. Sorry, but I think that it's helpful just to make sure we really know what we're talking about before we get to the real body of your paper. So let's just start off like real basic. Could you, would you be able to explain what Medicaid and Medicare are in like a couple sentences each? Sure. So Medicaid is a primarily state-run program uh, that's governed by certain rules that the federal government sets for state Medicaid programs. Each program is different in different states. And Medicaid is primarily for people who wouldn't have private insurance because either they have low incomes or because they have certain serious conditions that prevent them from working and uh, put them at risk of needing a lot of healthcare services. Medicare, on the other hand, is a federal program. It's essentially the same in all states, and it's offered to people once they turn age 65. In fact, you're automatically enrolled in Medicare once you turn 65. And I can tell you, you start getting mail about it a little bit before you're 65, <laughs> yeah, probably. just in case you are interested. That and the ARP, <laughs> they're right on top of it. But then there's other routes that get people into Medicare before they turn age 65. And that includes particularly people with serious health conditions that make it so they can't work, impair their ability to to be employed. And so you can be determined eligible for Medicare before age 65 due to a work disability, or if you have certain conditions like cerebral palsy that you acquired in childhood and your parents are your guardians and they have Medicare and they pass away, you also become automatically eligible for Medicare, even though you might only be in your 20s or 30s. It's so complicated because there's all these sort of other routes into both of the programs. But I've always thought of Medicaid as like a social safety net program and Medicare as like insurance for people who can't work either because they're retired uh, at age 65 or for other reasons as they're uh, going through the workforce. Is that kind of like a 
Yeah, I think that's a really good way to summarize it, definitely. And again, I mean, the thing to realize about Medicaid is that because each state runs their own programs, some of the um, requirements for eligibility can vary a lot from state to state. So like in some states, if you're pregnant and you meet a certain income threshold, so your income is below the maximum income for Medicaid, you can receive pregnancy services, but then once you deliver, you may no longer be eligible for continued health care services in Medicaid in your state. And so it's this crazy system where there are different paths into the programs. And depending on where you live, which state you're in, and depending on you know your financial status, you can become eligible for Medicaid but then suddenly become ineligible. So there's a lot of like dropping in and out of the program over time. One of my other take homes is like, if you're confused, it's because the programs are confusing. <laughs> like there, there's a lot yeah, of- I mean, lot insurance of is one of the most complicated aspects of our healthcare system and Medicare and Medicaid. I mean, you pointed out just the uh, similarity of the names, people often get them confused. But Medicare is the federal program and Medicaid is the state program. And now we're going to we're going to complicate things further in two ways. The first one is that you could be eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. So talk about like what what would be a, a kind of common circumstance where somebody would be dually eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Right. So there's over 12 million people who qualify for both programs simultaneously. An example of someone who would qualify for both would be someone who was employed as a young adult and then say in their 20s or early 30s, they started experiencing psychotic symptoms that eventually got so severe that they lost their job, couldn't find another job or you know, was unable to work. And at some point, that person would qualify for Medicare because of this you know, so-called disability, work disability, and they would be eligible to receive cash income payments from the government under something called the Social Security Disability Income Program, or SSDI. That same person, if they also, say, became homeless and lost all their assets, they could also qualify for Medicaid because they have essentially no income and they have no assets. And Medicaid does cover people who fall below a certain threshold of poverty. And at that point, they would be both Medicare and Medicaid eligible. So a couple of questions on dual eligibility, being both eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. You mentioned an example of somebody experiencing psychotic symptoms and having an onset of a mental health issue. Is that a common way to be dual eligible? Is that something that's common for dual eligibles or common for people with serious mental illness? It's very common for people with serious mental illnesses that are really chronic and, and severe. I think there's roughly 4 million dual eligible persons or almost one in three who have some type of chronic mental illness, maybe not to the level of a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but with severe mood disorders or an severe anxiety disorders. So that uh, makes up a significant chunk of dual eligibles is, this, is the group with severe mental illness. Another large group are elderly persons with dementias, Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia who do something in me Medicaid called spend down which means that their healthcare expenses for nursing home care or for round the clock home care are so great that they eventually run through all of their assets, all of their income and all of their assets, and they become essentially wards of their state. And at that point, as I say, they do this thing that the government calls spend down. They spend down to the point where they are eligible for Medicaid. And so at that point, they since they're elderly, they already have Medicare and if they gain Medicaid coverage. And then how would, so let's say I'm dual eligible. I have both Medicare and Medicaid and I go to the doctor. Let's say I go see my psychiatrist every month. How does the 
So what, what happens on the back end with in terms of who pays for that care? A situation where you have both Medicare and Medicaid coverage, Medicare is the so-called primary payer and Medicaid is the secondary payer. So Medicare does cover outpatient psychiatric care and usually pays, I think, 80% of the Medicare approved fee for psychiatric office visits. That amount would be covered by Medicare. Now that leaves a 20% copay for the patient. So if they didn't have Medicaid, that copayment would come out of their pocket. And so if it was, say, a you know, $400 visit, they might owe, say, $80 out of pocket. But because you're duly insured, Medicaid will pick up those out-of-pocket costs. And so the $80 that's expected, at least some portion of that would go from Medicaid to the provider to supplement the Medicare payment. And this is something to remember for later on when we actually discuss the paper, right? Which we right. will, I promise, we will get to the paper. Uh, after one more brief diversion into managed care. So there's managed care in both Medicaid and in Medicare. So how do you how do you make sense of that? Or even better, how would you make sense of that if you were just kind of trying to understand the basics around these programs and how managed care fits in? Again, managed care companies offer a variety of plans. A very popular type of managed care plan is called a health maintenance organization plan. These health maintenance organization plans that we've all heard of, like Kaiser Permanente, are prepaid or capitated plans where the insurer is also the provider of care services and they manage th those services. So in, like in the case of Kaiser Permanente, they're paid something called a capitation rate, a prepaid amount of money they get at the beginning of the plan year or monthly throughout the plan year. And they're then responsible, Kaiser is responsible for providing all the services and benefits that the enrollee is eligible for under their insurance plan. If it's a Medicare plan, they really the Kaiser Permanente would have to cover all of the Medicare benefits. Their providers or those that they contract with within their network are the ones providing those services. You can contrast that with a more traditional type of indemnity insurance plan or what we call a fee for service insurance plan. If those are, you might think of traditional Blue Cross Blue Shield preferred provider organization plans. In those plans, you can pretty much see any provider you want to see. You don't have to see the HMOs providers. You choose your own provider, but then the insurance will reimburse the provider a standard rate depending upon who you saw and whether they're part of a preferred provider network. But uh, you have more choice. And managed care grew up in the 1980s and 90s at a time when our healthcare system was much more oriented towards delivering care in hospitals and had a smaller outpatient sector. And so there was a lot of concern in the 70s and 80s about overuse of hospital-based services, of inpatient services, and that a lot of things could be done without a hospital stay. And so one of the reasons that managed care became so popular in the 90s was that because the managed care company, the HMO, is in a position to pre-authorize or pre-approve all hospital stays, they were able to shift a lot of unnecessary hospital stays into outpatient settings where those services cost less. And so managed care really grew on the promise that they could deliver care more efficiently and less expensively, and that they also would offer more preventive care and higher value because they are the ones who are financially responsible for everyone's for paying for their beneficiaries' costs. In this capitation arrangement, because the plan is the one who incurs the costs that exceed the capitation amount, the plan is incentivized then to ensure that their beneficiaries get preventive services like general health care services, primary care services, medications they need. So you see in a lot of managed care HMO plans that there's there are very few copays 
for services, for preventive services, you're often assigned to a usual care provider when you join the plan. And, you know, they would, for certain prescription medications, like, say, cholesterol-lowering medications, and for SSRI antidepressant medications, they probably would have very little or no co-pays for those medications, but you wouldn't be able to choose any medication you want. You choose the ones that are approved by the managed care organization. That's really different than in a traditional insurance arrangement where you know you can have any provider or any medication that's prescribed to you. It's just a question of how much the insurance will pay or not. So there are real trade-offs, is what I'm hearing you say, between the traditional kind of multi-choice and the more limited HMO type of arrangement. Right. You're you're trading less choice in you know in the manage in joining a managed care plan, an HMO plan in particular, you're going to face more restrictions on your choices of providers and and, and treatments but you benefit with some advantages in terms of co-pays and in terms of value, perhaps. There's a couple other things that are important about public managed care plans that serve Medicaid and Medicare. One thing is that all the managed care providers in Medicare and Medicaid are private companies. They may be for-profit. Many are for-profit companies. Companies like Kaiser Permanente are not for profit, but United Healthcare is a for profit company. And those are two of the larger providers of managed care services in the country. And so, in public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, we care not just about, you know, quality, which we obviously care about and value, but in those programs, we also care about equity and sort of accessibility regardless of income level or regardless of where you live or who you know. There's some concern that in a private for-profit company that you may skimp on certain services that would disadvantage certain groups within the plan. And that's always been a kind of a concern with private providers of Medicaid and Medicare services. So is it right to think about Medicare and Medicaid are they're like insurance programs, right? They're a package of benefits. And then if you're in a managed Medicaid program or managed care Medicare, then there's another agency company that's managing that benefit through a network of providers in order to drive down costs. And yeah, in order to uh, and improve quality. offer greater value, <laughs> yes. uh, both for, for perhaps for their shareholders and for the public. Apologies for getting rid of. <laughs> I think that's I aims. think that's probably <laughs> how they would view it. Yeah. Now we're almost there. The managed Medicare programs are called Medicare Advantage, correct? That's correct. So when you hear Medicare Advantage, that's just managed Medicare. I would say private Medicare. I, I love the way it's called advantage, right? <laughs> There's a little kind of play language uh, right. manipulation there, but we should have a spin-off podcast just about like <laughs> Medicare, Medicaid. But for the purposes of, of this podcast, people sign up for a Medicare Advantage plan. You can choose, right, between Medicare and Medicare Advantage, and you can go That's on right. the Medicare Advantage plan, which is managed care with the Medicare. That's right. You may be offered dozens of plans uh, in your area. And then within Medicare Advantage, there's a special program called Dual Eligible Special Needs Population. And that is what you are looking at, at in this paper. So with all that background, could you explain to us what those are, those Dual Eligible Special Needs Plan? And then what are you looking at here? What are you trying to find out about them in your study? Back in 2003, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services who run Medicare and Medicaid created a category of Medicare Advantage plan called special needs plans. And these were to serve those groups within Medicare who had special needs. And there were three types of special needs plans, chronic illness, special needs plans, or CSNPs, institutional 
special needs plans for people living in nursing homes, and those are ISNPs, and then a third category, dual special needs plans, and those were for this special category of people with dual Medicare and Medicaid insurance coverage. And so these dual special needs plans only enroll people with dual Medicare and Medicaid coverage, and that's the population they serve. And these DSNIP plans have grown rapidly over time. They're by far the most common type of special needs plans or SNPs of the three, and they now enroll over 4 million people out of 12 million duals. So one in three duals is in a uh, DSNIP plan. That's a huge percentage. Right. They've really grown rapidly over time. And one of the reasons is people have found that dual special needs plans um, have a higher profit margin because the way the government pays these dual special needs plans ends up giving them extra monies because they're serving a relatively more complex, more severely ill group that has higher needs and higher costs. But the, it ends up being that the special needs plans generate a profit of around 6% per person per year. And the regular MA plans are more like four and a half, five percent 5%. And so there's an incentive to be part of this DSNP market if you're a managed care company. So from the consumer side, what, what would it be like to be in a DSNP rather than just having not either regular old Medicare Advantage or does it simplify everything? I mean, it's very confusing, right? To have both Medicare and Medicaid. And um, does it make it simpler, easier or? Yeah. I mean, that was the idea like originally with these DSNPs was they were created for the purpose of being able to coordinate between Medicare and Medicaid. And the idea was because these are managed plans that the managed care company would be in a position to sort of track things and sort of sort out the different discrepancies between the two programs. And I mean, we've already talked about how insurance, just even the terms of Medicare and Medicaid are confusing. I think for everybody, insurance and what it pays for and how to go about getting access to care that you need, it's confusing for everyone. Well, imagine if you have two plans, you have a Medicare plan and a Medicaid plan, you have two different insurance cards. You have two di two separate login IDs for the different companies. You have different things covered by the different plans. So M Medicaid will pay for skilled nursing care and other long-term care that Medicare does not pay for. Medicaid also pays for a lot of home-based healthcare services and other community-based specialized behavioral health services that Medicare doesn't pay for. An example would be a service, Lisa knows something about called critical time intervention. Some Medicaid programs do cover services, either critical time intervention or similar transition services when you're transitioning people from hospitals to home that Medicare does not cover. And so it's unbelievably complicated and the idea of, of DSNPs was that they would coordinate you know, these benefits, but it actually has turned out, we're starting to learn that they haven't been doing that so well in most cases. And one of the reasons is because the person's Medicaid coverage could be from an entirely different company than the one who covers, who's the Medicare Advantage provider for Medicare. So the Medicare Advantage managed care organization may have little or no financial incentive to coordinate with a, essentially a competing organization that covers a different set of services entirely. And so what we're, you know, this is still, I think this is where we get to sort of the current research and the reason for our paper is that we really don't know a whole lot about these dual special needs plans and the type of quality of services they provide, and it's an active area of investigation to try to figure out, are these dual special needs plans, in fact, doing what they were intended to do? That's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at provider networks. So that's 
surprising that, that we're 20 years in to this and we don't really know what's going on under the hood. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like, so getting more into your study, you're talking about provider networks. So my, my understanding is that you would, these DSNPs are serving dual eligible people and uh, like significant proportion of them have serious mental illness and that you would expect hope maybe even that the DSNPs would have a broader network of mental health care providers than the regular Medicare Advantage plans. And my understanding of kind of the, the driving question of your, of your paper is, is that true? Right. Do these SNPs have a, a wider network for mental health services? Yes. I mean, that, that's what I expected going into this because I thought, well, I mean, these, these as you point out, that there's a disproportionate number of people with serious mental illnesses who have dual insurance coverage. And so these plans are covering a special population that has a high need for mental health care and substance use services, or also for coordinating mental health and physical health services, because people in this group tend to have more than three quarters have at least one serious medical condition in addition to their serious mental illness. And so we thought that for this special population, you would certainly need more, a broader range and a greater number of behavioral health care providers. And we had data on psychiatrists. Unfortunately, our study is limited in that we didn't have any data available on providers other than physicians. So we don't know, for example, about the numbers of psychologists and the numbers of social licensed clinical social workers in these plans, but we do know about physicians. And so we were able to isolate the networks for psychiatric care separately from these managed care networks for other types of providers, primary care providers, and other specialists like neurologists and cardiologists and so forth. So just, you know, 10,000 foot overview. What did you do? And then what were some of your findings? And did they correspond with what you had, had expected to find? Our interest, again, was in comparing different Medicare Advantage provider networks on how inclusive they were of the psychiatrists and the other physicians in their service areas. And so what we did is we looked at all providers, all psychiatrists, and all other types of physicians in each of the areas served by the DSNPs and by other MA plans. And we compared the percentage of those areas, psychiatrists and other providers who were within the networks of these DSNPs and other MA plans. And our, again, our main purpose was try to compare with the expectation that the DSNPs would be more inclusive of a service area as psychiatrists than the MA plans given their membership. Once we were able to create a common measure of that inclusiveness or breadth, as we call it in the paper, um, we could quantitatively compare. And so we looked at psychiatrist network breadth and non-psychiatrist network breadth for other physicians. And we ended up finding that the psychiatric or psychiatrist networks uh, were smaller on average than the non-psychiatrist networks. Overall, there was a difference of 0.303, so 30.3% of psychiatrists were within network in all types of Medicare Advantage plans and 35.5% of non-psychiatrists. So there was a difference of about 15 to 20%. The psychiatrist networks were 15 to 20% less inclusive than the non-psychiatrist networks. And then when we compared the DSNPs to other types of MA plans, the sort of regular MA plans, we found that essentially the same difference held in both types of plans, that the psychiatrist networks were smaller than the non-psychiatrist networks. The DSNPs were slightly better in terms of breadth. So I'm reading here from the paper that mean psychiatrist network breadth and DSNPs was 31.9% and mean psychiatrist breadth in other MA plans was 29.9%. So 
you know, roughly an eight or nine percent difference with DSNPs being slightly broader, but even that difference wasn't statistically significant. So we couldn't even conclude that there was a difference. So not what you expected or hoped for, right? Like you, what you were going in looking for was that the DSNPs would have a larger psychiatrist network than the other types of Medicare Advantage plans because they're serving more people with mental health issues. But if there is a difference, it's very small, not statistically significant. And right. Why? Like, do you have a sense about why this is? Well, that's, I mean, that's, we can speculate about it. We don't have any real data at this point. This is a, this is the question that we want to answer. Like, why, why wouldn't they? And um, we think that it has to do with the incentives that these plans face and also with government regulations. So as we talk about in the paper, one aspect of this is the requirements for Medicare Advantage plans in terms of their coverage of psychiatrists. We talk about in the paper how the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has this rule that 90% of beneficiaries within a plan should live within a certain number of miles of at least one provider of 27 different specialty types. So psychiatry would be one of those provider types. And so when you think about that, that in one sense, that's, you know, a, a good requirement in the sense that it means that most people, nearly everybody would be sort of, I guess you could say within striking distance or within driving distance of a psychiatrist. But then when you think of it more in terms of like, well, is that a really adequate requirement to ensure that people would have access to psychiatric care? And it's sort of on its face, it looks like it's way too low, right? It's, you know, if you only have one psychiatrist serving hundreds of thousands of people, it doesn't, that type of requirement isn't going to guarantee access by any means. It seemed low to me. <laughs> and so I'm glad yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't misreading the rule, especially coming from, you know, I'm living in Brooklyn and I'm thinking like, you know, you could have a huge plan here and to meet that requirement would be like not adequate to serve the population. So I'm sure there's, I'm not sure, but whether or not there's other things that, that uh, ensure that you have a, a wider network than that. But well, and then you throw in the fact that, you know, now with telemedicine and telepsychiatry, how does that affect all of this? But right. I understand that. That's not that... a part of current yeah. <laughs> uh, requirements for right. MA plans networks. And so the government does have an oversight role here. On the other hand, one of the concerns that I've been hearing about or, and reading about is that if you make these network requirements too difficult, you're going to make it impossible for the plan and they won't even offer the plan. And so there, there's a broader concern that we know about that there's an enormous shortage of psychiatrists and other behavioral health care providers in a lot of regions within the country. And that kind of shortage also makes it difficult for managed care companies. And then when you, you know, to recruit behavioral health care providers into their network, and then you add on top of that, the fact that I think something like 20 to 30% of psychiatrists don't accept any insurance because the insurance pays less than they can, you know, the, less than they can charge patients who are paying privately. And they, they're able, many psychiatrists are able to work that way. And and I should just say, some will say that the insurance payment doesn't even cover their expenses. So Right. And just... so, um, I mean, this has been a longstanding problem in insured mental health care, I guess, and or in mental health insurance. And, you know, as a result, we think that the participation in Medicare Advantage provider networks is low among psychiatrists generally. And so that's part of the problem. And then in the paper, it's also pointed out that a lot of psychiatrists are not volunteering to work with people who have really severe complex mental health and physical health conditions, like you find among people with dual eligibility. And so there's a certain fraction of providers who want to serve public plans, who are active serving public plans, but most of the research indicates that those providers that are serving Medicare and Medicaid enrollees with serious mental illnesses is a relatively narrow group. 
who provide the most of the care. And so it's really important that these DSNP networks would have a lot of those Medicaid, particularly psychiatric providers within their networks. But again, there's this in misalignment of incentives in most DSNPs because the, the DSNP is only responsible for providing Medicare services. They're not responsible for providing services that are covered by Medicaid, but not by Medicare. And that includes a lot of specialty mental health care services that you may have heard of, like assertive community treatment and supported employment and critical time intervention is another one. And services that often are team-based, specialized services that are supporting people, people's ability to live in a community residence and not in an institution. And those are often, those types of specialized services are Medicaid covered, but they are not covered by Medicare. And so the Medicare Advantage companies, including these DSNPs, are not inclined to bring those providers into their networks. And this is an enormous problem that extends well beyond mental health care, but mental health is one of the areas it affects. I just have to say that it's such a pleasure, Eric, to hear an economist speaking with an understanding and knowledge of the needs, you know, in, in, a, in a more complex way than I think you know, is ordinary of the needs of people with a variety of different mental health conditions and severity. So I really appreciate that. And thank you for, for tackling uh, this space. <laughs> thank you for helping educate me and train me, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Eric and I worked together for many years. So. How would you hope that a policymaker would take these results? Well, I, you know, hopefully our results and other results that are coming out in this on this topic will be somewhat of a wake up call to the organ the state organizations and advocacy organizations that have an interest and a stake in mental health care that they should be paying a lot of attention to these network requirements one of the things that hasn't happened yet but that um is starting to change is that nearly all dsnp plans do not have their own contract with CMS. The DSNPs are offered underneath or within an existing Medicare Advantage contract with CMS. And so it's impossible for CMS to set separate requirements in that instance with the DSNP itself. It can only set requirements for the Medicare Advantage plans in general that it's contracting with. And so we're starting to move towards a situation where CMS has direct contracts with these DSNPs and can be sort of more assertive about the types of requirements they might have or might need to have for mental health care. It gets very sort of wonky when you get into these details, but they matter, you know, for what actually can happen. That's another lesson I wanted to make sure we underline because these kinds of nuances can make a huge difference for the life of a person with serious mental illness. And so we have to somehow educate ourselves and get behind and, and get, get involved with this level of policy if, if we really want to improve the care of people. That's right. And, you know, I mean, we look at, you know, as an economist, we look at these data that we have but underneath the data are actual people. And if you're in a DSNP that has a very narrow psychiatric network that is not including a lot of the providers near you, you're gonna to have to go out of network. And although people who have dual coverage, they don't end up facing higher costs necessarily when that happens. The problem is, is that when you go out of the network, then your care is no longer really being managed by the managed care company. It's being sort of farmed out. And it leads to a lot of fragmentation so that there's no one provider who's coordinating the services that you might need as a beneficiary of the plan. And what we want is a system that's both comprehensive for these people with very serious conditions and also accessible so that and where people with serious mental illness are being engaged to be part of the planning. So what the concern is about DSNPs is results suggest 
that everything they should be doing, they might not be doing on behalf of their beneficiaries. And that's really where the concern comes in. As we're coming to an end, are there any take-homes for like a clinician who would be somebody's primarily a clinician seeing clients when either reading a paper or thinking about some of these really, uh, like you said, in the weeds policy questions? Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize that Medicare needs psychiatrists and that every clinician has to make a decision about whether it's worth it for them personally and financially to participate in managed care provider networks. But there's definitely a great need out there among patients and something to consider. A lot of the problems that we see with DSNPs have to do with government regulations and the way the program works creates poor economic incentives. And so a lot of the solutions are more at that regulatory system level rather than at a individual clinician level. Well, I do think that it one thing that it it does do just even on the clinician level is it increases some empathy for people who are receiving these services. It's incredibly complicated. I mean, when you mentioned just having two password logons, I was like, I'm out, you know, like, <laughs> like no way. Um, so we really appreciate you educating the, you know, the policy end of things, but also our clinicians, because I think it's important for people to understand w- what's going on under the hood. That's really making the lives difficult for um, some of the recipients that we work with. I just want to echo Lisa for um, thanking you for coming on and your clarity of explaining these really thorny and complex issues. So, so thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Josh and Lisa. And thank you, Josh, for helping me walk through this uh, podcast. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. That's it for today. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org, to read the article we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Bearson. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual speakers only and do not necessarily represent the views of the American Psychiatric Association. The content of this podcast is provided for general information purposes only and does not offer medical or any other type of professional advice. If you're having a medical emergency, please contact your local emergency response number.